step behind the camera and welcome to the eye photography podcast so hello there thank you so much for coming along and listening or watching uh, to the next episode of the eye photography podcast this is Stephen here thank you very much for subscribing if you have done and if this is otherwise the first time that you've listened to a show uh, you're in for a treat um, I've brought along one of our fantastic eye photography members, Steve Heffernan. Uh, Steve is a UK wildlife photographer, um, and he's been with eye photography for maybe about a year or two, I think it is possibly. We'll find out. Um, but yeah, he's really kind of, um, you know, risen up the rank kind of quite recently. His wildlife photography is something that's been very, very eye catching. And I wanted to bring him on the show just to talk a little bit more about it, because um, I don't think he's necessarily been doing it for that long maybe he's not been a wildlife photographer for absolute yonks but either way i wanted to get the kind of the skinny on it find out a little bit more about him what he enjoys shooting you know what what kind of issues he may kind of find necessarily when shooting wildlife photography because i know it's a tricky area but either way i just really wanted to kind of celebrate what i think is a really really strong and striking wildlife photographer if you're if you're listening to the show um on spotify apple Podcasts, wherever it may be in the show notes i'll make sure i put some links to steve's um social media or websites if he's got one we'll try and get that from him and if you're watching this on youtube obviously we'll kind of put a few images into the uh, into the video as well so you can enjoy his amazing podcast uh, it's amazing podcast it is an amazing podcast but i mean his amazing photography <laughs> getting the two p's mixed up either way i've got steve waiting in the wings so i'm going to bring him straight into the show and then we'll do our interview so thank you very very much for listening and i hope you enjoy it let's get on with it so welcome along steve um it's thank you very very much for coming along to the podcast um and i know appreciate you know though i know quite a bit about your photography in terms of what i see in the eye photography gallery for those that are listening and watching on the show um that may not be that familiar with your photography i thought it'd be great to get a little bit of a, a backstory really kind of about you as to kind of what you do as a photographer how you've kind of come to be so have you got like a, a little bit of a bio that you can give our listeners yeah um my first camera was probably in my early 20s, my first SLR film camera. And I really fancied myself as a photographer, but I don't feel like I ever mastered it. I used to buy all the magazines. I, I, I'd go do a few courses. I mean, they weren't online back then. Um, but I don't think I ever really got off auto, but I just loved the medium. And I think at, at the time I used to be a, a printer. So I was always working with colours and I was printing photographs. So maybe it was that link, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it's I've um, quite a few people have said that before that they've it's it's almost like kind of photo envy they've got. They've seen all these like lovely images that they've worked through, whether they're in framing or printing, and that yeah, it's kind of inspired them to go on. Yeah, but I don't feel like I ever mastered it. And then I was always that person on the holiday, you know, who was taking forever to take a picture when everyone else just wanted like a, a family snap. <laughs> I'd be the one like trying to sort settings out and everyone getting fed up. <laughs> uh, does that still think, happen now even when you go away now <laughs> a little bit but I'm a bit better now a bit quicker so. um but yeah I do like to go out on my own as well so that makes it easier but um no and then I think probably when my daughter was born it maybe took a bit of a back seat and then I think with the advent of mobile phones mm. and the cam as cameras improved on them I just didn't pick a camera up again for I'm not sure how long really until about four or five years ago I, I taught my daughter into doing um she was doing a Duke of Edinburgh award. Oh, yeah. So I suggested doing photography as a skill. So I thought I could help her and it'd give me a chance to start again. Turns out my camera wasn't working. So I had to buy a brand new SLR. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why I said I've not used it for so long, but it was just a memory card slot. Yeah. Uh, so I got an entry level um, Canon and she did the course. And that, that's when I first probably picked it back up again. But then it's not since it's probably the beginning of lockdown. Um, I took a few pictures because I had nothing else to do, posted them on a local Facebook group, and I was getting like a really positive response. And I think that's kind of helped um, motivate me to continue um, giving me, because so, so, so much to photograph locally. Um, and from that, I started the eye photography course, and it's just gone on from there, really. But so, I'd say this is the most consistent I've been the yeah. last two years of not putting a camera down. Um, and I've noticed a huge improvement through that. So it's been like a gradual thing really for you by the sounds of it. There's been, a, yeah. I suppose, a stop start type of thing. And as you say, like, you know, if you, you've got other people getting into photography, has your, has your daughter still kind of carried on with photography? No, she hasn't. She's at university now. I mean, she talks about doing it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I traded my camera in, so she can't have it. 
<laughs> I think she had her eye on it, but I traded it in. So <laughs> she, might go back. she sent me a few pictures on her phone. So I think she's maybe a little bit interested. Well, yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's it's. I do find, or I hear certainly a lot of stories of it kind of being passed down the generations in a sense as well, that, that people kind of, you know, maybe like their grandparents have done it or they saw their mom or their dad kind of, you know, used to be going out with the camera and they wanted to kind of, you know, be, you know, take the pictures when they were young and it's just extrapolated into something bigger and bigger and snowballed over the years. But, you know, for, for what you do now, for what I've seen a lot and the, the thing that kind of caught my eye so much about your photography is a lot of your images are now like wildlife, nature, landscapes, et cetera. Is there a particular reason as to why you're drawn to those areas? Is there something that, you know, have you always had an interest separately in, in kind of wildlife or is it just, you know, it's been a really good medium for you as a photographer? Yeah, I mean, I've always loved the outdoors um, and actually my job, my day job is as an outdoor instructor. So I'm like, I teach climbing and kayaking and archery, forest school. So I'm, I'm just outside the whole time, wow. probably 80% of the time I'm outdoors. And it, it just feels like my natural environment yeah um, so then to take a camera along with me is just like an extra bonus really that's brilliant so, also, I work in a primary school so I take children out doing rock climbing kayaking oh, archery. so yeah. you know all really good locations to kind of get to where's where we'll be busy and where we'll be quiet when you need to you you've got a lot of knowledge behind that I guess yeah yeah so yeah I'm just when I'm outside that's just where I feel sort of happiest if you like oh, so I think it's just a natural progression to bring my camera with me and yeah yeah that's it. I I've mean, always, I've always enjoyed so wildlife. Yeah, never, never captured it on camera, really. No, no. Well, as I say, it's one of the. I, well, I would say anyway, given that I'm not really a wildlife photographer, I think it's one of the the genres that I would struggle with personally a lot. I think it's a very, very tricky medium. You require a lot of patience, I imagine. <laughs> That's I'm probably sure one thing we'll kind of go on to talking about, you know, a lot of persistency, but planning as well. So as you say, if you know some good locations to get to places that you can maybe get to that the public can't necessarily, you know, that's always going to give you a slight advantage. But on the front of uh, of kind of camera talk, as we were just mentioning before, that you had uh, an entry-level Canon DSLR a while ago. Is that what you still got? What, what are you shooting with now? What's your camera kit? Well, I upgraded the lens first. I think it was my birthday last March uh, when I was taking more wildlife pictures and I was getting frustrated that how close I could get, I couldn't get that close. Yeah. So I was, I, I was bought, um, I think it was a hundred to 400 mil lens. So the camera I had was crop censored. Um, and then the start of this year, the end of last year, I kind of, I was getting frustrated again with the bird. It's one of them things you, you kind of, my pictures were getting slightly better, but then I realised I was missing something and I could only do so much with it. I know they say it's the photographer, but there is only so much you can do with uh, some kit. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I did some research and I ended up going mirrorless um, and I went for the R6 in the end, yeah. the Canon R6. Yeah. Um, I was really keen on the eye tracking, the autofocus eye tracking, I thought, because of the bird photography. Yeah. Um, yeah. But obviously that, was, and I was thinking landscape as well. So that was full frame. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to find a camera I thought might be good for both. Yeah. But then I realised by buying that camera and going full frame, I'd lost that extra reach from the 100 to 400 mil. Yeah. 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 You know, you know how it goes, don't you? <laughs> it is unfortunate. Um, I mean, you you have got the the benefits slightly. Is that even though you're on, um, you were previously on a Canon, which would have been the EOS mount, and now it's gone up to the R mount. I think I'm right in saying you may be able to still get a converter, basically an adapter to go from the EOS to the R mount. So if you've got a lens that is effectively a lens suited for and made for a crop camera, if you then adapt it and put it onto your full frame, you'll still get the advent the advantage of the crop factor through the lens yeah. because it's designed for it so you you may be able to with a bit more you know have to buy some more accessories etc the alternative is spending more money and buying a, an, an rf lens which I, is... did, I, did, I didn't go that far but i did upgrade the 100 to 400 yeah to, uh, to 150 to 600 oh wow so I, tra I traded the um the the entry level camera and the tamron lens for this new sort of the sigma 150 yeah. to 600 well, you've got the right type of kit and I, I would fully agree for anybody that's listening because I know everybody, everybody, a lot of people that listen, you know, are always looking out for little hints and tips, uh, especially within wildlife photography, because it's so diverse that 
I think I think personally mirrorless is the way to go because for what you've just said that the tracking that it's all built around speed um, and certainly you know that the benefits of having full frame for shooting landscapes as well is always very very helpful to get that extra dynamic range but especially when you're photographing because you, you shoot a lot of birds don't you really so you've yeah. you've always got that kind of I'd say pitfall of motion and certainly having a camera that reacts pretty quickly um, is is ideal but have you found that's been an advantage you know have, have you have you noticed that your photography has improved because your kit has helped you i think so i'm capturing moments now that i, I you know as good as you might get i don't think i was ever going to capture with my entry-level camera i don't i don't think it was down to ability i think it was just the capability of the camera yeah and i'm finding even though i'm not i don't feel like i'm there yet i'm definitely capturing more opportunities that i would have missed like you say with the motion with the speed yeah uh, it's definitely helped with that so obviously, as a photographer, I can still improve, but that's definitely given me a nudge the right way. Um, I think it helps with confidence as well. I, I've certainly noticed myself that when you, like, like we always say, you know, it, you, and you've rightly said, it's not about the camera, you know, that doesn't make the photograph, but certainly when you're able to kind of get past the hurdles that you are experiencing of, uh, you know, of not being able to kind of capture the moment at the right time, it makes you feel a lot more confident when you do get those shots. You're thinking, well, actually, it's not necessarily maybe a problem with me as a photographer, though there is always things that we can learn. Um, yeah. Sometimes the kit does, you know, cameras have limitations. Every Even, you know, buying the top end camera will have a limitation at some point in some situation. But certainly now, do you feel that you're a little bit more hopeful that, you you know, you're going to be kind of you know, potentially get in good stronger shots with the camera that you've got now yeah definitely and, and i think because the camera is such an upgrade i'm looking forward to i think it's going to take me a few years to actually get to grips with the actual camera itself yeah. which I, i'm quite excited i like i like i enjoy learning so now i've got this this camera it's probably better than me <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking forward to the challenge of le- mastering that camera yeah um, so i still feel like a novice but i have got more chance to capture yeah shots i want well, that's it. If anything, you've probably got a longer shelf life with this camera that there's probably a lot more now as technology progresses that you can kind of catch up to and learn to. Whereas maybe with your entry level camera, you know, you, you hit the buffer of what it could do and, you know, what you could do with it kind of quite quickly. And then you need to kind of go up to the next stage. But um, it's, it's all very, very, very good points, I must say, because when you come to photographing wildlife, as I'm sure you will we'll talk about and uh, I'm sure you've experienced, there is tons of I say hazards and pitfalls, you know, that not necessarily is limited by the kit, but, you know, in the past couple of years, you know, whilst you've been photographing a lot of wildlife, have you noticed certain hazards that kind of come up, you know, that you could warn other budding landscape uh, wildlife photographers about things that you've seen that reoccur over and over again and things that you've had to adapt to? Yeah, I, I, I think you've got to get, you've got to be willing to get up early. <laughs> definitely that's a hazard <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I mean i don't actually mind but in the summer that gets harder and harder oh but, yeah uh, and obviously weather can play a big part um but what i was finding with a lot of my photography a lot of it was because it was early in the morning i might have been in woodland i was really struggling with light yeah so i was getting really really noisy pictures now the the, the new camera is a lot much better with noise um, and I learned from Rachel on one, the wildlife course that she run about not worrying too much about noise. It's about the, the shutter speeds and the aperture. The noise is not a lot you can do about really with fast moving mm. animals. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've learned that. So light has been a big pro- uh, a hazard, I would say. The time of day you have to get up, the weather. Yeah. Um, and understanding your subject. So I'm, because I am interested, I am trying to learn more about the birds that I want to photograph. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can't rely. I mean, I've been lucky on a few occasions, but I think if you want that the shot, like on my tip list is a kingfisher, and I've seen one lots of times, and I'm learning more about its habits and where it might be nesting, but I've still not got that shot yet. But I'm yeah. quite enjoying that challenge. Um, well, that's an yeah. interesting thing, really, because that's especially with wildlife. And I've I've spoke to uh, you know quite a few other wildlife photographers previously um, on on the course and on podcasts, and it's it they've said previously you know it can be quite hard to obviously get those shots it takes a bit of patience as we said earlier and a bit of persistence and you know sometimes you're going out you're shooting two three four hundred frames even more and you're not getting the shot that you want and you're basically kind of coming home and going oh it was a washout that day but what 
keeps you going as a photographer what what kind of gets you up the next day and say well no actually I'm going to try again and I'll, I'll hopefully it'll work you know how because it's probably quite easy for a lot of people to do it maybe a few times over then just go you know it's not working either my camera's rubbish or just me <laughs> as a photographer's rubbish but yeah do, do you kind of have any motivational things that you do or is it just a mindset that you you kind of approach photography as I think obviously you go out to get a shot but for me it's just being outdoors that this the shot for me is a bonus that I've gone out to get pictures but if I've spent two hours three hours out and I've come back I've not had a good picture mm. I've still had a good time certainly I, I've appreciated this more over um, lockdown in terms of my mental health Mm. that's where I'm at my happiest yeah uh, and the camera is just an extension of that for me it's just I'm capturing them moments so when I come back if I do get a picture it's yeah that's a fantastic morning I've got that shot of a day yeah. if I don't come back it's it's not it's not so much of an issue for me it's not the end goal really yeah no um, no that's it, a nice thing to hear it's, what, being what, the, what? it's being outside that's the the main thing that and is the, 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 the photographer is a bonus yeah yeah. So as you say, your, your, your passion for the outdoors, you know, is just there through and through, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, with your with your portfolio, I say I've been looking at some images and we'll, we'll kind of put them up on screen for those that are watching the, the podcast on YouTube to have a look. There's, there's kind of quite a variety, as you said, there's a little mixture of uh, kind of uh, uh, wild birds. Then I've also seen kind of some more like native birds. And then you've got like the your bigger like deers, etc. But do you have a, a favorite animal that you like to kind of go out looking for? As you said, I know you've got the kingfisher as on your, your bucket list, but it's the one that you would happily photograph over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I quite like photographing the deer. Um, and I, I, I'm getting, I know kind of where to find them now. And I'd probably say, seven times out of ten they, they might be around about but my challenge now is to try and get closer to them yeah and um, so i'm taking them from quite a distance away from the opposite side of the canal but I would, i'd love to be able to set up somewhere and really study them and get close to them and you know try and catch them really close up yeah like like get really really kind of tight in yeah so i think that's that'd be a challenge so i i, I drew up a list about a year back of certain birds that i wanted to try and get the oh, kingfisher is right. still there. Um, that's that's just winding me up. The kingfisher. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they are. I've I, I see, and you see so many pictures on Facebook, and I think they may be just going to hides where they're guaranteed to see them. So maybe I need to do that. Yeah, rather than trying to track down a wild one. But, In uh, fairness, um, that's a lot <laughs> of what. Um, I, um, we did with when recording the the wildlife course by photography. Mm -hmm. um that we spent a bit of time well I didn't personally but but uh tutor Rachel went out and she was spending a lot of time in bird hides because she said it's just really a, a little hub you know yeah. for for wildlife as you said because sometimes you can go out to your back garden and you may not see any birds for absolutely ages but these hides they're very much you know particular community that if people are looking after them correctly and maintaining them right they've got a nice a nice kind of community of birds that are always coming towards the the bird feeders and the little the, the ponds etc but yeah if you yeah. can kind of get to like a local bird hide and just reserve a hut for yourself for, for half a day or something like that fingers yeah. crossed you know they, they should be able to tell you what type of you know birds that they have in that area as well and if they've got a kingfisher then then yeah. yeah good luck with it really but i think if you're if you're kind of putting yourself in the hot seat of the right place to be at the right time um you're yeah. probably going to have more success than than not really as well but is there is there any kind of other elusive animals that you would love to photograph even not in the uk uh, I'm not really thought so much about abroad, but I, I really want to get a picture of a fox. Oh. I've only managed one so far, and it was quite like I say, it was back with my earlier camera. It was very early morning. It was very grainy the picture that I got. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that in terms of a mammal, that's the one I want to get like locally. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. You you will have to be up early or staying out late for, for that or other. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine they they'd be fantastic because I you see a lot of people talking about how foxes are becoming more um urbanized and you know they're, they're kind of coming into towns and cities etc but i still think to kind of capture them in the kind of native environment you know actually out in the countryside etc um is absolutely beautiful because i've seen a lot of images um i think there has been a few bbc photography competitions recently um and that have been kind of popping up on the on the website and there's some absolutely incredible images of foxes so yeah i can see as much as people kind of see them as pests in some place photographically yeah, yeah. speaking very 
very pretty indeed. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good luck with that one, definitely. <laughs> but one question I wanted to kind of come to before we started to wrap up, this is what we call our time travel question. Um, we, we ask it pretty much nearly on every like uh, podcast interview that we do. But if you can kind of put yourself in the position of basically going back to when you kind of first picked up a camera, so to speak, with all the knowledge that you've got now, if you could kind of give your younger self a golden nugget of information about kind of photography or maybe just how to make it more easier or something, you know, that would really help you out in the long run. What do you think you would, you would say to your younger self? I probably should have stuck with it more and dedicated, made them a main hobby rather than having several hobbies. I should have really kind of, because I did enjoy it and I did want to get better. But I think other things just got in the way. I don't quite know what, but yeah, we should have stuck at it because 30 years, I almost, I changed jobs actually about um, 18 years ago before I started, before I worked in the outdoors, I was working as a printer. Yeah. Um, and when I was up and about what jobs to look at, to do, I actually considered photography and that would have been about 18 years ago. Um, so for a brief time when I wasn't sure which direction I wanted to go in, I actually looked into options and whether I could get into photography or not. <laughs> um, as it happened, I didn't. I ended up working with children and working the outdoors, but oh. uh, you know, it's come full circle because I'm doing both now. Well, that that's it now. You, you, you're enjoying it. And, you know, photography has no, you know, age guidelines or anything like that, that we have, especially, uh, you know, I, I see day to day that now we actually have a partnership with the Duke of Edinburgh Award. So we're seeing a lot of young people coming into our courses and programs and starting up to their beginning from the age of 14 15 16 and then we also go to the opposite end of the scale and we see a lot of people who are retirees that are coming in to take courses because now they've got they've got the time they've got maybe a little bit of money so they're able to kind of get themselves the, the kit that they've wanted but they've got the time as i say to actually then go out and, and enjoy themselves whereas that kind of middle period of life kind of 20s to 50s yeah. um you know you you may have the money etc and the energy but you don't have the actual the, the time to do it really so the, the fact are you mean are you finding kind of just taking days off or do you take your camera to work with you and shoot I don't take it to work but I do have Fridays off now so that's a day when I'll dedicate quite a lot to photography I've been going over to uh, Martin May to the wildfowl centre yeah, yeah. On a Friday because it's perfect for sort of practicing with birds because you know you're going to see them yeah uh, so I'm using that as a you know somewhere to go and practice oh brilliant but my daughter's gone to university now so I've got a lot more time on my hands but yeah, so you don't have to do kind of all the uh, the dad oh, jobs, etc. Yeah, <laughs> dad taxi. Yeah. So for anybody listening, then Steve, I know if if they've been watching, they would have been able to kind of see some of the images that we've been, uh, you know, from from your portfolio. But for those that have just been listening, do you have a website or um, any kind of social media uh, accounts that people can kind of jump onto? Because I'll add them all to the show notes for anybody else that's that's listening or wanting to watch. Um, but have you got like a website that they can go to or an Instagram or something like yeah, that? Yeah, um, Facebook and Instagram, and they're both um, Steve Hef Photography. Brilliant. So they've both got the same title. Um, so yeah, if you look up Steve Hef Photography, it should take you to a Facebook page where I put my pictures on in different albums. So I've got local pictures, I've got wildlife pictures. Uh-huh. The wildlife one seems to be the one that's growing now. <laughs> yes. um, I need to get back to landscape a bit. But um, yeah, and then I have Instagram where I put a few pictures up as well. Fantastic. Well, so for those that are listening, I will put all those um, links. I'll get them off Steve and I'll put them in the show notes. Um, so if you want to kind of go and check out his photography and I please, please uh, kind of employ you to do so because there's some absolutely beautiful wildlife photography and landscape photography in there. So for anybody that's looking for a bit of inspiration or wants to know a little bit more about Steve, then yeah, you can jump on there and have a look. But um, in the meantime, Steve, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on to the show. I, I appreciate a lot of people that come on and do these interviews with me. It's, it can seem a little bit indoors and a little bit kind of scary but it's really nice just to find out a little bit more about the the person behind the camera and the person that makes those images because like you said you know it's the camera is just there as a tool as a a byproduct in effect but it's that person that kind of makes those images so it's nice to know a little bit more and maybe we can catch up in another six twelve months and we'll 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 see how you progress potentially if that's cool yeah no that'd be great excellent yeah. lovely well thank you so much anyway for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure and for those that have been listening or watching thank you so much for kind of jumping onto the podcast and kind of keep listening and subscribing as you do you wonderful people and we will catch you in the next show so thank you very very much steve in the meantime thank you it's been a pleasure